Friends, just before we begin a television show, we always decide on the time at which we are going to quit. And you often wonder, well, how, how do you manage to finish on time? Well, I just keep looking at the clock, and then two or three minutes before the time is finished, begin to weave into a conclusion. Now, you have no idea how lucky you are that television always runs on time. Because I want to give you this historical fact. There was a man, I will give you his name at the end, who on November the 28th, 1955, began talking in Kent, England. He talked until December the 3rd. He talked for five days and 13 hours which is the record for continuous talking. His name, Kevin Sheen. <laughs> now they say that women talk a great deal. The record for women is only two days and 14 hours. It was held by a Mrs. Clapp. She couldn't keep her clap shut. Well. <laughs> Tonight we are to talk on the subject of the meaning of love. What is love? Well, that all depends upon whom you're asking. To a psychiatrist, uh, love is a, a libidinous instinct. He calls it an id. And it becomes interesting to him when it manifests itself in aggressiveness and jealousy and hate and anything that creates a psychiatric problem. To the novelist, love is interesting not when it is a virtue, but generally when it is a vice. Adultery, perversity, and so forth, constitute the themes of many novelists. To a biologist is nothing but an animal instinct that has been carried over into the human order. To a comedian, love is nothing but a lot of dame foolishness. You understood me correctly, didn't you? <laughs> love is really none of these things. Love is a feeling, a groping, a tasting, a sensing, and awareness of another. Love always refers to another, not just primarily to self. And here's where it differs from knowledge. Now, let me illustrate this. Um, very few of us ever think how different is this process by which we know in relationship to that by which we love? Whenever we know anything, we always bring the thing or object which is known down to the level of our mind. That is why when a teacher is explaining something in class, he will always give an example. It is degraded in some way, simplified. But the mind always, always insists that it comes down to its level. Hence, when the eternal word of God came to this earth, he spoke in parables, brought divine truth down to the level of the people. Now, love does not operate that way. As a matter of fact, love operates in just the opposite direction. For example, the object of love is something to which you go out. Now, here is the, the faculty of, 
of loving is the will. When you love anyone, instead of dragging it down to your level, you go out to meet it. For example, if you love music, you do not write your laws of music. You meet the demands of music. If a man is in love with a lady who, who loves poetry, he doesn't talk algebra to her all night, if he's wise. <laughs> you can immediately see, therefore, that the nobler the object that is loved, the better we become. That is why it, it can be said that the uh, level of any civilization is the level of its womanhood. Because the nobler the objects that are loved, the nobler a person becomes. The greatest philosopher who ever lived, Thomas Aquinas, said that the least love of God, therefore, is worth more than the knowledge of all created things. Because the knowledge of all created things merely draws things down to our own mind. But when we love God, we go out in order to meet the infinite. So it is love that makes us really more than knowledge. Now the next uh, uh, point about love is this, that Love is not just, therefore, the same as sex. Now, sex is one of the manifestations of love. But somehow or other today, the word love is not so often mentioned except in, in songs. And then have you ever noticed that they're always in the future? Never in the present. How happy we will be. I'll bake a cake for you to take for all the boys to see. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, sex, however, in, in common literature today, too often is a substitute for this noble affection. Now, though it is one of the manifestations, it is not necessarily love. And let me show you the difference. Sex alone is really not interested in a person. Sex is really interested in self. And hence a carnal man will very often, uh, apparently and seemingly, project his love uh, to someone else, but he's not loving that other person. He's loving the pleasure that he finds in that other person, which is not the same. George Orwell, uh, who wrote that remarkable book about the future of, of a communistic world called 1984, he has some people saying in 1984, uh, you like it, uh, don't you? I don't mean you like me. I mean you like it. And the other person says, yes, I adore it. was sex, not love. It. When the Soviet soldiers came into Berlin, they ran through the streets, the close of World War II, they ran through the streets shouting, I want a woman, I want a woman. They didn't want a particular woman. They were not concerned at all with the person. They just wanted something to satisfy their own ego. Hence the difference. You see what a good job my angel does in clearing the blackboard? And the reason he did a particularly good job is because this afternoon his halo was shined. <laughs> you know the kind of shampoo he uses? Halo. <laughs> this is a good chance for a commercial, isn't it? I bet they regret that. Well, Magic kissed it as Halo. 
this is the difference between uh, sex and love. I mean, not sex as an expression of love, but just isolate it. Sex is a circle. Have you ever noticed that's the only thing that I draw well, is a circle? <laughs> not perfect, but I mean it's much better than the things I usually draw. But uh, sex is a circle. It's bounded by itself. It looks only, only to itself. Love, on the contrary, is a cross. Stretches out in all directions. It's all embracing. Sex, to some extent, only to some extent, is like some of the statues we see of Buddha. Big, fat, sleek, well-oiled body, hands folded across the breast, intently looking inward, thinking only of self. And love is, is very much like sometimes the paintings or the statue of a, of a saint, thin, wasted face, but eyes upward, peering beyond the hid battlements of eternity unto God himself. So love, therefore, by its very nature is something that is concerned with the other or another, which brings us to this other question, namely the love of neighbor. Our blessed Lord said, love thy neighbor, love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, you might say, how can I like my neighbor? First of all, the neighbor isn't the one from whom you borrow sugar. The neighbor isn't the one who tells you that you're making too much noise at your party. He isn't the one that knows your affairs before you do. The definition of a neighbor is one who is in need or else your enemy. So the question arises, I can't like everybody, and I got certain neighbors I don't like, and nothing in the world can ever make me like them. That's true. So here we touch upon the difference between liking and loving. Certainly, there, there are things and there are persons you can never like, because liking is instinctive. Liking is, is an emotion. It's physiological. It's almost organic. It's biological. It's something over which you do not have great control. For example, you do not like olives. Now, I should tell you something I don't like, and I generally announce it once a year over television and over radio, so that if you ever invite me to dinner, you'll remember it. I don't like chicken. <laughs> now, nothing can make me like chicken. I'll tell you the reason why. People wonder why I don't like chicken. Well, when I was a boy, uh, my father uh, used to send us out every summer to a farm to work. He believed in hard work, for which I thank him. And the tenant farmer, very anxious to please my father, gave us chickens every day except Friday. So every morning I had to go out and wring a chicken's neck. <laughs> I've got, I must have wrung thousands of chicken's <laughs> necks. So when we hear the command, love your neighbor, and love everybody, and love all of God's creatures, well, that's all right. You can love them, but you can't always like them. <laughs> well, what, what is love? Love is not in the emotions. Love is not in the feeling, feelings. Love is in the will. 
And because it is in the will, love is subject to command. To command. You can never be commanded, for example, to, to like pickles. But you can be under a command, as a boy is under a command, for example. Now, please go up and kiss your Aunt Sophie. Now, he doesn't want to kiss his Aunt Sophie. But he's under a command, and maybe, maybe he does it. So love is subject, therefore, to the will. It can be ordered, whereas liking cannot. And we're only told, therefore, to love the neighbor. And how does this love work itself out practically? Because you may not be liking all the time. It is by doing a good deed. Do good to them who hate you. And as we begin to do what we ought and what is commanded, we may eventually begin to love that which we ought. And that is how we gradually come to love God and to love the neighbor sometimes that is not worth loving. Does that mean I have only three minutes left? All right. I thought I had five or six. I've got three, so I get very nervous and I have to change. No, he says five. Wasn't that nice that I asked him? He put up three fingers. Now I have five. Well, now I can tell you other things. See, he said, I'm off the clock. <laughs> you see, I like him for that and I love him for that. <laughs> now, our blessed Lord also said, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. How can we love our neighbors? we love ourselves? Well, there are certain times, for example, we really, uh, we like ourselves, we love ourselves, and other times we do not love ourselves. We, uh, we do not love ourselves when we are hateful and spiteful and mean and uncharitable and when we do embarrassing things. And then there are moments when we do love ourselves. We love ourselves when we're praised. We love ourselves when we're kind to the poor and so on and so forth. Now, how are we there for? To love the neighbor as ourselves, we are to love the things in him that are good, and we are to not love the things that are bad in him. We love the person. We may hate the sin, just like we love the communists, but we hate communism. And that was what was meant by loving the neighbor as you love yourself. Love the things that are good. And love even the person who does wrong. And by loving him, he may escape his wrong. That is why the church is always willing to accept the heretic back into the treasury of her souls, but never the error into the treasury of her wisdom. There are certain rules for, for loving. I will pass some of them over very quickly. One is, you can never love in a hurry. Love is never done in a day. You can hate very quickly, but love is slow. That's one of the tragedies of divorce. People do not stay together long enough to learn to love one another. And then a second law of love is that uh, all love e leads either to heaven or to hell. All love either puts us in touch with God or puts us in touch with the devil. When it's good, even human love, we feel that we're in communion was something greater and bigger and broader than ourselves. And when the love is illicit and wrong, we not only feel degraded, but we've, 
feel that we have degraded that which we loved. And finally, love is best expressed in terms of sacrifice. Love does not mean to have and to own and to possess. It means to be had, to be owned, to be possessed. It is the giving of oneself for another. That is why we speak of arrows and darts of love, something that wounds. And the day that a man forgets that love is synonymous with sacrifice, he will ask, what kind of a woman was this to ask for a ring of gold instead of tin? It's the day that men forget love is synonymous with sacrifice, they will ask, what kind of a God is it who asks for mortification and self -denial? Some years ago, there was an article appeared by a very well-known writer entitled Cosmical Religion. He said that he could no longer believe in a religion of love or a religion of fear, but he believed in a cosmical religion, the adoration of the cosmos. And I wrote an article and answered him, and I said I could accept his cosmical religion if he would only leave the letter S out of it. And in developing the idea, I said, um, we can never love the cosmos. We cannot adore it. It's too big. It's too immense. And man can never love anything except that which he can get his arms around. And the cosmos is too big and too bulky. That is why the Lord had to become a babe in order that we might encircle him in our arms. Well, I said that on television, and a woman wrote to me, and she said, do you mean to tell me, young man, this was some years ago, she said, <laughs> she said, do you mean to tell me, young man, that I can't love anyone unless I can get my arms around them? I said, madam, that isn't my problem, that's yours. Well, I hope now that you understand love just a little bit better. All love on this earth is just a spark that comes from the great flame of love, which is God. Now that you've heard this telecast, perhaps you understand why I always end a telecast in exactly the same way. Bye now, and God love you. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books. He broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. The bishop wrote 94 books, recorded countless radio shows, and appeared on hundreds of network and syndicated television programs. His legacy is a treasure of joy that transcends time and helps us to believe that truly life is worth living.